sorry, I forgot to record. So when we look at erectile dysfunction, this is associated with a number of conditions that impair the arterial blood flow to the erectile tissues or disrupt the neuronal circuitry. Now, these two aspects should be ringing a bell right now to say, what diseases are we talking about in terms of arterial insufficiency and disruption of the neuronal circuitry? Now, the greatest risk factor that all men have is that as they age, as we are going to age, the likelihood of having erectile dysfunction is quite high. So if we look at the history of erectile dysfunction, this is going way, 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 way back beyond 1600 BC. So in 1600 BC, we see a papyrus who used a topical application of baby crocodiles hats. So they kill the crocodiles, they take their hats, and then they mix it with wood oil. And this was applied on the penis to treat erectile dysfunction. Then, Samita comes in and says, no, let's consume uh, the testes of goats. And this practice is actually quite prevalent in some parts of Africa. And I think one of those areas is uh, in Kenya. When we come down now to the 1860s, 1908, we see that the role of modern science is coming in where now we have procedures such as the uh, uh, ligation procedures of the dorsal vein and to get to around the 1960s, early 80s now, where you can actually have a prosthetic implant. So from this timeline, it does show us that this problem has been with us for quite a long time, and the chances of this problem disappearing are almost close to zero. So let's look at the anatomy of the penis. How is the penis formed? The penis primarily, it has two uh, erectile tissue, which are the copra cavernosa, which lie side by side. Then below it is the copper spongiosum, which basically has the urethra. Then the facial layers will envelop the nerves, the lymphatics, and the blood vessels, which eventually are covered by the skin. The suspensory ligaments, their primary role is to support the penis at the base. So these are actually elastic fibers. So in terms of the hardware, because basically now we're talking about the hardware, this is not the software, we're looking at the hardware. Now, when we look at the software in terms of now what would be called the operating system is that the penis has to be innovated to some extent. And this is where we have the cavernous nerves that supply the smooth muscles. So this has to be at the back of our mind. Smooth muscles are really, really important in terms of um, performance or in terms of uh, having an erection. So when we look at the modern sensory innovations, these are derived from the pudendo nerves. This is another as critical aspect. The pudendo nerve as well as the pudendo artery. Let's keep that at the back of our mind. So these are the ones that will extend and it will be harbored within the penile skin, the purpose and the glands. And this is where now the role of uh, um, reflex, uh, reflexogenic uh, erection comes in because this arises as a consequence to touch. So when it is touched, there's a likelihood of the penis having to erect. So when we look at this uh, image, we look at that here in front, we have the glands penis, the external urethral orifice. This is actually very important in terms of the, some of the treatment options that we are going to look at. Um, a cut out section here, is showing us that we are looking at the copper spongiosum. Inside the copper spongiosum, we have the urethra. If you look at this cutout section, which is actually quite critical when you are going to do a pin out um, ultrasound, we should look at the way the everything else is arranged. You have the dorsal nerves, the dorsal artery, the deep dorsal vein, and the superficial dorsal vein. So. At times, uh, there is an excitement about, you know, the size of the penis, that it's large, there are, you know, uh, veins all over. You see, at times, uh, 
lack of knowledge can lead us to do things that are not right. And I guess this is one of the things that we see today where people actually engaged in uh, injection of uh, drugs such as hyaluronic acid in terms of increasing the, the girth of the penis. But you realize that superficial vessels do not play a major role, like the superficial dose of it. Its primary role is basically to drain. So when we go into the physiology in terms of the erection, we will then begin to appreciate why some of these things are not really as important as this tiny little bit of here, which is called the cavernous artery. There are two, one on each side. In between here, we have the septum, and then the two copra cavernous are covered by the tunica albuginea, which is actually a very tensile tissue that is quite responsible for compression of these uh, uh, veins during the process of erection. And then these spaces are actually called sinusoids. So if we look at the mechanism of penile erection, the penis in its flaccid state is not a state which we can say it is at zero. It is not because it is just a moderate state of contraction because uh, I think quite a number of men would remember or actually are aware that during the cold weather, they move from adult to pediatric in terms of the size of the penis. So that shrinkage shows that the tissue can contract. So what happens when there's a sexual stimulation? So this stimulation may be psychogenic. So psychogenic, which means it may come from the audiovisual arousal. It may be a, a voice, a mu music, uh, or a picture, or anything of that sort. So this stimulation is going to trigger what are called neurotransmitters that are in the cavernous nerve terminals. And this encourages now the release of nitrous oxide. So we must be uh, having in our mind to think of agents that are responsible for vasodilation. And what are we talking about? We're talking about nitrous oxide. We are talking about CA, uh, CMGP. So when the neurotransmitters are released, the signal is sent to the arterioles and the arteries for the, the smooth muscles of these to dilate. So as they dilate, it means that there's going to be less resistance. Less resistance means that there's going to be a high flush of blood going in. So as the blood goes in, the sinusoids are going to expand. As they expand, remember we talked about the role of the uh, tunica albuginea. The, now the subtunical venular plexus is, are going to be compressed because of that enlargement of the copra cavernosa. Then eventually the tunica is going to stretch and then this will then occlude the emissary veins. And in this process, we are, the, the penis has moved from the flaccid to erect. Eventually it has to get to a rigid state. So when we talk about pressures, you, usually in a flaccid state, we're talking about maybe partial oxygen pressure of about 35. So this is going to increase to about 90. Then the penis will then rise from a dependent position where it was obeying gravity. Now it wants to disobey the gravity, it goes up. As this pressure increases, there's going to be a contraction of the ischiocavenous muscles, which is going to be now what you call the rigid erection phase in the men. Now, for men that have a long, heavy penis or loose suspensory ligaments, the angle is not going to be greater than 90, even with full rigidity. So this is now consistent with the hardware because now the vessels may not be able to, to support that kind of a weight. Then the other thing is that the suspensory ligaments may also be weak. So this actually does, uh, uh, happen. So what I was just trying to explain here is that if you look at the image on your left, we are looking at the flaccid penis. Uh, the focus should be on this, the blue, the, these are the veins. Even the sinusoids have not increased in terms of the size. But after erection, you can see that these helicin, um, 
the sinusoidal spaces increase, then the subtunic of venous plexus have disappeared. So that rigidity implies that the blood now is all stuck in the penis and there is no venous return up until ejaculation occurs that then the, the muscles would then contract instead of dilating. So there is a very, very important aspect when we talk about um, erection. And this is the neurophysiology. Uh, there are certain things that if you were to turn off or remove from a human being, there would be actually zero uh, erection unless you put an implant. So we should know that the penis, in terms of its innervation, it gets both the sympathetic and parasympathetic and the somatic uh, senses. So the sym sympathetic originate from T11, dorsal 11, to the second uh, spinal segment of the lumbar spine. The parasympathetic pathways will arise from the sacral two, three, and four. Now, when we have lesions in these areas, most likely that can affect uh, the process of getting an erection. This is why when patients would have pelvic fractures, they can actually have uh, problems in terms of um, uh, having an erection. So the cavernous nerves, which you find on the penis, these are actually arising out of the pelvic plexus. These are the same uh, nerves that innervate the rectum, the blood, and the prostate. And this is why diseases involving the rectum, the blood, and the prostate, even the sphincters, are actually um, important because they can affect someone's um, uh, erectile function. And by the same token, excitement on any of those areas would lead to an erection. Doctors know for a fact how you, if you were to do a, a prostate exam for prostate excretion, the patient out of that process of uh, put, doing a digital rectum exam with a finger into the rectum, trying to palpate the prostate or massage the prostate, you can actually have your patient having an erection. So in, any of those zones actually does have an impact in terms of the erection. The somatosensory pathways, these uh, have receptors in the penile skin, the glands, and the urethra, but of course within the corpus cavernosum. So let's go to, the, to today's food, the etiology of erectile dysfunction. So when we look at the causes, we broadly, we are looking at organic causes, psychogenic causes, and combined origins. So when we're talking about organic causes. What are these? These could be vasculogenic, uh, that is arterial, cavernoso, or mixed. The neurogenic ones now, what we are talking about is that we are thinking in terms of the neuronal system, what is happening. We may also have anatomical and endocrine causes. Endocrine causes, we may be talking about thyroid uh, diseases. We may be talking about hypogonadism. Uh, so the psychogenic forms of erectile dysfunction, usually these ones, it's in terms of the state of mind. At times patients or subjects may have what is called sexual performance anxiety. Either they meet the, a partner for the first time or probably the circumstances of the sexual encounter makes them to be anxious. Their performance may be below par. But in terms of us as images or as sonographers, we do not have a much role to play in terms of psychogenic because there's nothing that you can basically do to investigate, to know what is going on. So when we look at Doppler ultrasound, our area of influence or our area of concern is basically vasculogenic causes. So today, if we were to get a pen and write down to say, what are the causes of erectile dysfunction? The first and foremost is arterial insufficiency or venous leak. If you go back to the image that I talked about, 
in terms of arterial insufficiency, the important thing is blood that has to go to the penis. So if there's arterial insufficiency, the vein in terms of its dam, it's smaller or it has plaque, it means that the stuff that is supposed to go there to enable the erection can't get there in the required amount. It means that we cannot lift this, for lack of a better term, this item. Diabetes. Diabetes is uh, one of those aggressive diseases which are worse than even having just a vascular compromise. Why am I saying this? With diabetes, there's a tendency of having nerve damage, neuropathy. But not only does it destroy the nerves, but it also damages the vascular bed. These are really important things to consider. This is why if you have a patient whose diabetes is not controlled, no matter what you can do in terms of their sexual function, they most likely you're not going to win because the two most important aspects have been destroyed. Drugs, I'm going to give a list of drugs that are actually quite, um, that, are, that are well known for causing such problems. If a patient has spinal cord injuries, T6 to L5, this is going to happen. If a patient has, say for example, BPH, then they undergo radical prostate, prostatectomy and at times maybe even robotic one. During excision of the, that section of the prostate, they can be damaged to the pudendal nerves that are running on the side of the prostate. Psychosocial issues. I'm talking about it because at times you get a patient that is referred to you for a Doppler, yet the only problem that they have are relationship issues, it's stress, it's anxiety, it's a psychiatric disorder. Others, it may be neurogenic. They may have Parkinson's disease, stroke, or dementia. Uh, this is not to discourage those uh, dear friends of mine that uh, appreciate the water that would have been that would have gone bad called alcohol. But alcohol does play a role in terms of erectile dysfunction, and so does smoking. Even for patients that have uh, BPH and then they're given drugs to shrink the prostate, that causes an effect in terms of their sexual performance. Pelvic fractures, pelvic radiation, priapism. Priapism, basically, we are talking about an, an erection that lasts for more than four hours. Some patients or some people, because they think they have a problem, they get a certain concoction and then have an erection. That erection does not go down consistently for four hours, they're having an erection. What happens? The vascular bed is going to be destroyed. So the next erection, you would need probably elephants and uh, the whole kingdom to try and resurrect things. There's also been an aspect, I think here in Africa, we've heard stories of the, the penis captiva. Some people have postulated that this can actually uh, lead to erectile dysfunction. Those that love riding bicycles, Neuropathy can arise from chronic uh, bicycle riding. Out of vascular surgery, I talked about the issue of low testosterone, thyroid disorders. So all these are causes of um, erectile dysfunction. I decided to include this endurational penis plastica or commonly known as Peyronie's disease. People have said that Peyronie's disease is part of erectile dysfunction. So it's a debate out there, but basically what happens in Peyronie's disease is that there's going to be a scar on, the, uh, on this surface there. Then the penis is going to have a very horrible angle that can cause pain to the, to the partner. And at times, this is the reason why some men can end up having a problem in terms of, of their sexual performance. So it's quite a debatable issue, but I decided to talk about it. So basically what happens is that they will be scarring. So that's going to come as, you know, a calcific deposit uh, up there, as you can see on the image on your right. So there is a hypothesis that deals with erectile dysfunction. And this hypothesis basically says that if you look at the penile uh, gland, the vessels that we have, the, the arteries, these are one to two millimeters. As you go up, 
to the coronary, to the carotid, the caliber is increasing. So ask yourself a common question. If pipes due to arteriosclerosis starts, it's most likely it's going to start in a place where yes, there's God. that small vessel. And these small vessels, unfortunately, becomes the small diameter of the cavernoso arteries. Now, there is a link. There is a very strong link. If you are having a problem with erectile dysfunction now, or you know someone that has erectile dysfunction and not just a small problem with erection that happened two times or three times, as in they consistently, they have no ability to have an erection or even to maintain it. Number one, send them for a proper review to exclude other things that they may be having because erectile dysfunction can predict the presence of cardiovascular disease. And this is why the bulk of the patients with cardiovascular disease also have erectile dysfunction. So when we talk about endothelial dysfunction, we're talking about destruction of the smooth, uh, uh, smooth muscle of the arteries. So basically hypertension, diabetes, smoking and aging are risk factors which lead to the endothelial damage. But what is the outcome that comes out of the damaging these vessels? As you can see here, we are moving from normal early lipid rich to uh, stable. We are talking about the first thing that is going to happen is in red, though it's not very clear. This is the erectile dysfunction. It starts, which you can link to the previous image. So we're talking about erectile dysfunction. Then we move to renal disease. But eventually, we are going to talk about myocardial infarction. So this is a strong link. So to measure someone's state of health, you might as well start from downstairs. I talked about uh, medication. So I think the common medications, these names may be sounding too Greekish or things that are far from what we know, but I know we have relatives that may be having hypertension, that may be having cardiovascular disease. The common drugs that you find on their medicine or in their medicine carbon, we are talking about uh, drugs such as telmisatan, which is an angiotensin II receptor, comycadis, the S inhibitors, these are drugs like captopril, enalapril, the channel, calcium channel blockers, which is uh, the nifedipine, antiretroviral also comes in, the NNRTI, the protease inhibitors and the like. But we are no, I know we are very familiar with one drug when you talk about um, uh, drugs that are given to, you know, uh, patients like as in diabetics. So the oral anti-diabetic drugs, things like uh, glucophage or commonly known as uh, metformin. So all these actually play a role in terms of having erectile dysfunction. So whilst you're trying to treat a patient for a certain underlying disease, at the same time, you're creating another problem. So you cannot completely exclude it. So in terms of the diagnosis of erectile dysfunction for a clinician, as in the doctor, the physician and whosoever, basically they rely on the physical exam to look at uh, the, the gonads, touch the penis, assess it for, nodularity if there is, is it even in terms of the shape and all that but the blood tests are really important because we need to be able to pick the comorbidities that i've just talked about once you know that there are these comorbidities those things can actually be attended to then the problem is addressed there is our component where we come in and the purpose of this talk to look at Doppler ultrasound. Some of the tests that they do is called an overnight erection test because the three types of erection are psychogenic, which is audiovisual arousal. There's the reflux, uh, reflexogenic, which is stimulation by touching, but there's also nocturnal erection that occurs at night during your rapid eye movement sleep. So if a patient has the nocturnal erection 
and they say they're having, and you then you know that their problem is definitely not vasculogenic, but rather psychogenic. We move in now to the sonographic anatomy of the penis. What you are looking at here, these are the two copra cavenosa CC uh, that I talked about earlier, and these areas are the sinusoids, but where the arrow is pointing, that is the cavernoso artery, which should form the basis of our investigation. So if you want to forget things, forget everything else, but if you ever want to do Doppler of the penis, this is the most important aspect, this there. Its size, its peak systolic velocity, because this is where you are going to focus all your energies. This is the corpus spongiosum where the, the um, urethra sits. So when we talk about the blood supply to the penis, this is a longitudinal section of the penis. Now, this air that is shaded white is the one that is represented here. These are the helicin arteries where you see the three arrows, but the one with the black arrow, this is our cavernoso artery. This is where our work starts. And that is where we do our measurements. So after having said all this, we've appreciated what a penis is, how the penis should get an erection, what can affect it from having a proper erection. Then the doctor has seen this patient. And then I'm hoping at this point, you have the capacity to be able to perform because in most countries, I must say this, in most countries, this procedure will be done by a physician or a urologist. And I think you understand why, because we are dealing with so much issues of drugs and this and that. So even in terms of injection, unless you are actually authorized to give certain medications, because even the medications that I'm going to talk about, these are actually specialist drugs. So depending, if, especially if you're in the public service, these will have to be signed off by specialists before you actually administer it. So in terms of the equipment, we have to use a high frequency probe, linear probe, of course. Uh, then the penis is scanned from its ventral surface using the longitudinal and transverse views. The importance of the longitudinal view is that that is where we'll be able to obtain our uh, Doppler uh, uh, scans from. The transverse is for us to measure the size of the cavernoso artery. So the evaluation, and this is really important, don't do Doppler ultrasound for patients with erectile dysfunction in the flaccid state, because whatever you are doing is bogus, is not scientific, and there's no basis for it, because you, it's, it's wrong, basically. If you are going to do this procedure, do it in the erect, I mean, the flaccid and erect state. And then in the erect state, we have the three states, where it's uh, feeling the tumescent phase, the full erection, and the rigid erection phase. So the analysis is based on the Doppler results that will be, this means the spectral analysis. You have to set your machine to a slow flow rate. Then in terms of the drugs, you're going to use papaverin, fentolamine, or any prostaglandin E1. So this is injected on the lateral aspect of the mid shaft of the penis. But you start with the flaccid state, then you move to the erect state. Now, the environment has to be very private because it's a private moment. And it's also ideal that you may want to do this at a time probably when you are less busy or what, because things can go haywire. You may have a patient that has priapism because of what you did and the, that direction won't go away. And how are you going to move your patient from this to that? So usually the air that you're going to do, it's really, really important. And like I said, it must be done by a person that is trained 
trend to know what do you do when this happens or you must have a physician present with everything else that is required in terms of your emergency trolley because that is what is going to save you when things are going out of control the important thing is that there is need for visual and audio stimulation erection without stimulation there will be no release of neurotransmitters this is why you can take even one kilogram of viagra and there will be no erection for one simple reason that there has been no stimulation stimulation is actually a very very important aspect of this examination so we have two stages the first is called the pre-injection phase and the second is the post-injection so in the pre-injection phase we're going to perform this exam in a dimly lit room because you are also playing with the psychology of the patient the patient lies supine you need to have a flexible ruler because you have to measure the length of the penis as well as its circumference when it's flaccid if you are trained you can palpate that flaccid penis to look for nodularities calcifications and other irregularities but if you're not trained i guess this is the part where your your clinician does this the penis will rest on the stomach pointing upwards so which means the corporal cavernous are the ones that are lying on the anterior abdominal wall and the corpus spongiosum is the one that is more superficial so you have to obtain your images in sagittal sections checking for fibrosis things like that we talked about peyronie's disease or any other abnormal echogenesis because this is your b scale then you measure the intraluminal diameters of the left and the right um cavernoso arteries once you are done with that you get a 27 to 30 gauge this is a needle similar to what if you've seen patients that self-administer for insulin this is the kind of needle that we are talking about so you then inject that vessel active uh, agent which is, whether it's papaverin or whatever is available so the prostaglandin e it's good because it's it is 10 times less likely to cause priapism which is a good thing so you start with a dose of 10 micrograms as a starting dose then the penis is held firmly at the best for 40 to 60 seconds so that the vessel active agent is retained within the corpora because if you don't the the veins are going to drain it and it, nothing will happen then you leave the patient in the room with that visual stimulation five to ten minutes so that the penis now would go up so this picture is showing you where you are going to inject from at that angle so you avoid the midline we have uh, vessels major vessels there the superficial vein try runs just in the midline there and quite a number of, so you you take it from the side so in the post injection phase you repeat what you did in the other thing is that you are going to obtain the b-mod images of the cavernous arteries document their sizes because now they should be larger in terms of the size because you want to see to what extent have they increased then you're going to shift to your doppler mode adjust to six degrees so you then determine your systolic and end diastolic velocities you repeat so you start with the right then you go to the left or you start with the left and go to the right so you have to repeat these at several points ideally maybe say up to three times or you have to ensure that you're capturing them in the filling phase the tumescent phase full erection until there's the rigidity then you still get your ruler you measure the circumference and i'm not really sure at this point whether you know females would want to do this procedure you know because you'll be measuring 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 i don't know but then anyway if you are that's your job description i guess you have to go ahead so then you have to ask the patient like sir how does your erection compare to what happens at home so that's a very important question to get so in on this image on in image a the penis is flaccid that's why you see both cavernoso bodies are just like uh, looking thin and flat 
after injection, it's the central zone now that begins to change in terms of the, the echo texture. It's now intermediate because the sinusoids are now distending. By the time you get here now in this uh, image, we see that it becomes thick and it has become big and rounder. In the final stage here, you can even see that there's the, what is called the intracavenoso pillar here. This, that is going to appear. This dorsal shadowing here, it's basically your septum that is appearing dark. So these are the stages of uh, changes of the penis from a flaccid state to an erect state. So the measurements, like I said, this is your cavernoso artery. So this is where you're going to constantly measure. And ideally you should look at the junction of the proximal one third and the distal two thirds of the penile shaft. That is the point where you're going to measure because if you measure at other areas, you may find that you're going to get a very, very hopeless uh, Doppler signal. So now A here represents your flaccid penis. So with this waveform, no clinician will use this. It does not belong anywhere other than the waste basket. Only if you proceed, if you just do this and you stop there, it doesn't help in terms of management of a disease. You need to move now to the next step, step B. So that in B, we are now looking at uh it's now beginning to fail here is the tumescent phase by the time we get here in this particular image we are looking at a full erection you can see that the peak peak systolic so may we mute our mic at, on this image now, we've seen that the peak systolic has hit the roof. In this case, it's rigid. There's nothing going out and going anywhere. It's all stuck. And we are happy now. There is, we have our rigid, rigid erection phase. So when we look at the cases of um, erectile dysfunction, just uh, pay attention to this image for a bit. Your sampling get is there. If you look at this, the peak systolic, it's, it's below 25. Below 25 means we are having issues. And that is called arteriogenic and erectile dysfunction because the peak systolic is less than 25 centimeters per second. This image plus this image is showing us that we are having now a venal occlusive erectile dysfunction because if you look at the dorsal, uh, uh, the deep dorsal vein here, you should not be having flow because if our science serves us right, what we state that there must be obstruction in terms of the venous flow out, everything should remain in. This openness is telling you that there's a venous leak. So if you just observe in the erect, in the flaccid state, you will not be able to compare this. Neither will you know that once the penis is erect, the maximum peak systolic velocity that it can achieve, you will never know this. So this is why I said that the examination at that point would be incomplete. So the diagnostic criteria, basically, we are looking at a normal that should be above 35. 25, 35, it's a gray zone. Okay, we may need to investigate the patient further with other things in mind. Abnormal, definitely less than 25 centimeters per second. Then the same applies in terms of the deep dorsal vein and also the end diastolic, no more ranges are given. So this is how you would then interpret your Doppler 
parameters. You've done the examination, patient goes, the patient may ask you now, with my problem, what, what are the options? What are the treatment options that are there? I know it's, it's Africa, if you are in Botswana, there is a place that is called uh, DBT and there is um, what they, they call a service kit. I don't know what these guys sell, but it's in like um, these plastic bottles. Uh, it has some amber to dark, like cork kind of a color. God knows what is contained there. I guess a lot of people go th that side. That's the African approach. But you know, in terms of Africa, we don't know what we'll be ingesting in terms of the dosages, the strength, and what exactly, what is the mechanism of action? Because drinking and having a reaction is not good enough if you don't know what you're basically ingesting. So there are what are called the PDE5 inhibitors. People have heard 1992, there was what was called the blue pill. The blue pill is Viagra. So basically what it happens is that this is a catalyst or it works on the CMGP so that it can increase the amount of nitrous dioxide in the tissue. And the important thing is that you want to have a lot of, um, oh sorry, you want to have the levels of CMGP to increase. So this is where, now the interesting thing about all these drugs that are selectively being used to inhibit the enzyme, these initially were actually being used for treatment or they were meant to improve endothelial damage and they were presumably having a myocardial protective property. Now, the patients that were being given this drug were actually cardiac patients. Now, these patients are taking this and uh, they're not even giving feedback in terms of how they're improving in terms of their myocardial function. They kept quiet. If you go back to the prison, the earlier slides, when I showed about the diameter of vessels, this drug actually started by working on the cavernosal arteries, not working on the uh, carotids, not working on the coronaries. This is where now the game changes. In the US, they moved the blue pill, they brought in even other drugs such as the Cialis, to increase because when you look, use uh, a drug such as Viagra, its action time is probably, it goes up to an hour, an hour before it's taken, then the stimulation for an hour, they can be very good performance. But then they brought in Cialis, which extends the activity time to about four hours, so we, which has a, a better life lifespan. But then another interesting thing is that do not be shocked if you may see some of your clinicians, maybe your vascular surgeons, prescribing the same drugs for treatment of gangrene, because actually it has been shown to be able to restore perfusion to gangrenous areas. There is another method that is called the intraurethral suppository, which is basically a drug in put in a suppository form called our prostadial. So this will be inserted through the meatus. This is why at the beginning of the talk, I did mention in terms of the glands penis, I pointed out the role of the, the um, uh, uh, urethral orifice. So it's inserted about two centimeters in. Then the same action as the oral meds, there's going to be a lot of blood that is coming there. The penis gets engorged. Eventually the patient has a good erection and then they can actually maintain it. The downside to this is that they can be pain, minor bleeding, dizziness, and the formulation of fibrous tissue yeah, in the urethra. Yeah, yeah, After, may, may we mute our mic? So the fibrous tissues now in the urethra are going to lead us to a new problem, which would be urethral strictures, then your patient needs now a urethral program. So this is not so common, but it's there. 
There is a newer principle called shockwave therapy. The basis basically it comes from the same application of uh, use of high frequency ultrasound to destroy, say, renal stones. So in this procedure, you actually subject the tissue to about maybe say 100 pascals, megapascals, uh, that is directed to the penile tissue. So as a consequence of the shock wave, there's going to be signaling of normal endothelium and recruitment of stem cells. Now, to what extent this works, we are yet to know because it's one of the most recent advances that are there on the market. The intracavenous injection is exactly what I've just explained in terms of the procedure that you perform as a clinician to do a penile Doppler. The only difference is that the patient does it for themselves at home. But the first uh, injection, it has to be supervised by a clinician. So after teaching the patient how it should be done, they will then go and do it at home. 25 minutes, 20 minutes before uh, activity, they inject stimulation, then they have the erection. But the downside is the same as what would happen in your case if you are doing it for purposes of investigation. That time it was investigation, here now it's therapeutic. So there will be pain, there will be fibrosis, there may be priapism, and there may be a hematoma on the side of injection. But it's reportedly like about in one study, they said, you know, 60% of uh, patients were happy, others uh, felt no, the erection wasn't uh, doing, but uh, truth be told, nothing can beat what uh, God created. Then there's something called penile prosthesis. In penile prosthesis, the two cavernoso bodies are removed. Then you replace them with two cylinders. Then you place at the back of the bladder, you're going to place a reservoir that contains a liquid. Then between the testicles, inside the scrotum, you're going to put a pump. So when it is time to have an erection or to have intercourse, the patient simply pumps. So the fluid then moves from this reservoir and goes into the two cylinders. So it's going, if you see here, this bottle is full, the reservoir is full. Pump, pump, goes into the penile gland. Then erection is achieved. Activity is done. At the end of the activity, the, this is pressed, the pump, the fluid moves from there into back into the reservoir. Now this thing, um, for most diabetic patients where there's neuropathy and what, this is what they end up doing. But the downside is that once your cavernoso body, the corpora cavernosa are affected, that's the end. So you can say, no, I'll do it and then I'll go back to taking medications or anything else, no. It's a one-way street. It, you've done it, you go forward with it. Malfunctioning is one of the challenges of this thing because like any other electronic device, boom, things move from being parallel to the ground, I mean, from being perpendicular to the ground to parallel to the ground. And this may happen in very awkward places. So though the technique is being improved, but that they are no, they, it's nothing that is fail safe. I did mention, and I repeated so many times concerning the role of the pudendal arteries. So there was an approach now, or people were trying to see or the same thing that we do in terms of uh, coronary arteries. Like if a patient has a, um, a, a narrowing in the circumflex, then you deploy a stent. So in this case, we are looking at an obstruction here. You see there's been endothelial damage and if plaque that has formed, so there's obstruction in the pudendo. Then you deploy a stent and you restore. But the problem is that this procedure is super cumbersome and you may just to get to the pudendo uh, artery, it's an arm and a leg, not very easy for most clinicians. It is there, but very difficult and not widely practiced. Now let's go to Africa. 
So in terms of the, uh, the medicinal plants, it's reported that there are thousands of plants that possess aphrodisiac and sexual stimulant purposes. But let us co not confuse the two. The problem of the erection has got nothing with stamina. So if a patient says, no, I'm going to get, take a lot of testosterone to improve my erected, it won't work. It won't work. You can only improve your libido, your fighting spirit during the activity. That's what that will do. So the important thing is the stimulation. So unfortunately, these things, there have been no studies where people aggressively take these things into a lab and then say, no, look, what are we looking at? So you go to Nigeria, you're going to find things called Impotex, Tiger Power, Super Love. You get to Zambia, you're going to find Congo Dust, 4x4, AK-47, Mwana Apeluke. These things, whether they do work or not, and if at all they work, in terms of the mechanism of action, you wouldn't know. So whether they are killing the system or improving the system. I hope with talks such as this, us as clinicians, you would be in a position to run your own study. There's a lot of AK-47 in Zambia. The population is huge. Alcohol consumption is quite... So pick up all these people with a lot of risk factors. Do your science, your Dopplers, engage lab scientists. Let them take these samples and say, what is the active ingredient? Does it work on the same receptors that we've been talking about, the CMGPs? Does it increase nit nitrous dioxide? Is it in the same class as our P... PGE5 inhibitors. When we do that, then our practice now, we can say we don't need to import penile prosthesis for African people. We are going to use our own plant derived remedies. Unfortunately, like I said, there are no proven studies so far. As I conclude, if you're a man or if you're a woman and you know someone that has a penis, remember that erectile dysfunction is real. And the basis of erectile dysfunction as it is with cardiovascular disease is endothelial dysfunction. Early detection is very critical because you can do quite a lot in the early stages of any disease. If you exercise, daily every day if your diet is good every day you may avoid some of this or you may minimize the problem but when you avoid some of this you delay in terms of the early detection because this thing has a link to cardiovascular disease early death may be imminent and let us remember that erectile dysfunction predicts cardiovascular diseases. Thank you very much for paying attention. That is the end of our talk. I do hope that we picked up something and we'll take this uh, to the next step. And by my mere presentation of this does not mean I'm a guru. I'm not a sexologist. And this was ne not a talk about sex, but erectile dysfunction. It was not a talk about importance because you may, you may have strong erections, but you may be important. That let's not confuse the two, importance and erectile dysfunction. Thank you very much. May the spirit of Omoja, Popahano, and unity prevail. Thank you. I end here. Um, uh, thank you so much, Mr. David, for such an amazing and brilliant presentation. Um, uh, probably you should open a men's clinic. You're going to have a lot of people queuing. Um, so for anyone that has got any questions or any additional